Tonight's meeting is to help us improve our japa. How come you have two? Nobody knows why. We're taking you to level two. Okay. If you're watching this, everything is backwards. Oh well. We tried our best. I guess, um, keep going. Okay. 
go back to what we learned in level one. How many of you came to the Japa workshop that we gave like five years ago? Two of you? Five of you? How many of you have heard any of my Japa classes online? Okay, anyway, this is a review. Chant from your heart rather than from your lips. In other words, chanting is not any heartfelt emotion is expressed not with lips, but with heart. Correct? Like, you can say anything with your lips. You can say, I love you, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything unless you actually feel that. Correct? <laughs> One time I asked a person, how are you? He said, do you really care? I said, no, not really. Something like that. So it can be said, but there's no interest or no care. So chanting is the same. You don't actually chant with your lips. Now, the problem arises if you look at japa as a process. Because if it's just a process, then you would say you do chant with your lips, right? Does that make sense? It's a process. So what's the process? Prabhupada said the process is to chant with your tongue and hear with your ears. That's the process. So if you only look at it as a process, then you'll think, if I just chant 16 rounds or whatever your quota is, I'm successful. Because I said it so many times. If you don't love someone and you tell them 1,728 times you love them, does that make any difference? Will they be convinced? After, one th after two hours of telling them you love them, will they be convinced? If you don't feel it, they won't feel it. So, when we're chanting, it's not a process. You see, there are meditation processes especially popular in Buddhism. But I'm sure in Hinduism also, I'm not familiar with all of them. But there are meditative processes which don't involve a relationship. Uh, for example, you can do a meditative process by focusing on your breath. Just, just concentrating on your breath. That's a process. There's no person, there's no relationship. You could meditate on a candle that's a process. Right? Meditate on a candle. There's no person, there's no relationship. It's a process to calm the mind. You could meditate on a spot on the wall. That's a process. You can close your eyes and focus on your emotions. That's a process. There's no relationship. Maybe relationship with yourself. But no relationship with a person. So. In that sense, then when you do the meditation, you do the process, you focus on the process. Whatever it is, focus on your breath, focus on the candle, focus on your emotions, whatever you're meant to focus on. Can somebody turn this down a little bit? And I'll put it closer. No, the volume. <laughs> All you have to do is turn one of those down and you're bound to get one of them right. Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithyananda Shri Advaita Gadara Srivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Keep going. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithyananda Shri Advaita Gadara I don't think you're hitting the right button. Sri Krishna Chaitanya See, that's what happens when you chant and you don't chant properly. It's like the wrong button. Nothing happens. Okay, <coughs> a little louder. Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Upar. Krishna Chaitanya. Okay, that's good. Thank you. So, 
what we what we should understand is that when we're chanting don't think of it as a meditative process because what it is it's a relationship it's a it's a communication it's a prayer and it's a relationship between you and Krishna so it's not an impersonal process it's not a mechanical process in fact nothing in Krishna consciousness is mechanical it's all personal right? isn't it? do you agree? If you don't agree, raise your hand and we'll throw you out of the temple. <laughs> I'm an autocrat. Now, this is very important. <clears throat> so when you understand this, it will alter the nature of your chanting. Now, one of the things that Prabhupada said, one of the meanings that Prabhupada gave to the Holy Name was, Krishna, please accept me. So that's a very relational statement. What does it mean? Krishna, I left you. I want to come back and establish the relationship, so I'm asking to be accepted. And I'm tired of my relationship with Maya. I don't want to be engaged with Maya. I want to be engaged with you. So please accept me, and not only accept me, but please empower me, or give me the strength to fulfill that intention, to turn back to you, because I've turned away from you. Now I want to turn back. And I need both your help, and I need your acceptance. Now, if you think about that as the meaning of the Maha Mantra, and that's what you're chanting, that's what it means. There's a lot of emotion there, isn't there? I, le I left Krishna, that has a lot of emotion, doesn't it? If you just think about the fact that you left Krishna, you're probably going to feel very bad, right? It's a very heavy thought to think that I turned my back on Krishna, isn't it? So when we say, Krishna, please accept me. The idea is that that heavy thought, which is weighing on us, is motivating that prayer. Please accept me. Because I feel so bad that I turn my back on you. And I feel now the need to reconnect. I feel remorseful, remorseful. I feel guilty. So that emotion empowers your japa. How many of you think like that when you chant japa? Raise your hand. How many of you think, I just have to get my rounds done, 1,728 mantras, yeah. So that's, that's the, the um, difference between process and relationship. And if you chant in process, it's going to be very slow advancing because it's almost like you've neglected Krishna and turned the relationship into a process. You know, could you imagine you have a process relationship with your mother or process relationship with your husband or wife? That would be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> How does it work? Well, every day at 5 a.m. I say this. I have a script. You know, I, I recite these six prayers to my wife. You are the best. You're the most beautiful. You're this and that. And then she recites her prayers, and then at 11 p.m., 11 a.m., we call one another and we recite our prayers. And that would be weird, wouldn't it? Don't you think? <clears throat> that would be like a processed relationship, mechanical. So we should see Japa a little bit like that if we're if we're thinking in terms of process. Okay. So. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur said, you don't chant with your lips, you chant with your heart. And he, he explained that, is that the lips come after the heart. In other words, you feel something, you express the feeling with your lips. So the first thing is the feeling, then the expression is a manifestation of how you feel. Right? So he said, that's how we should chant. 
It should come from feeling, Krishna, please accept me. Krishna, please help me. Krishna, please engage me in your service. And that feeling should generate the chanting. But if you bypass the feeling, then you'll be in process, and then you'll just be counting on your watch when you can finish the process, and then you probably think, well, if I do the process, someday something will happen. And then, you know, after 20 years, you start wondering when's it going to happen. It's going to happen when you get out of process and you get into a relationship. Does that make sense? And you can do that right away. You don't have to wait 20 years. So he said, it's not lip deep, it's heart deep. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and Srila Prabhupada have explained that just saying the name of Krishna is not Krishna. In the, I think the best way to understand this is if you see the deity as a statue, then for you the deity becomes a statue. But philosophically the deity is Krishna, right? Isn't it? We say Krishna is in the deity, he's non-different. But does that mean that everybody sees it that way? No. For some people, it's just an idol. Or maybe for some people, it's not even an idol. It's really nothing. For other people who are in, who are in Krishna consciousness, it, they can see it as non-different from Krishna. Thank you. Like, um, you remember the story... Mahaprabhu would go to Jagannath Temple and he'd see Lord Jagannath and then he'd faint because, and it was said that he was seeing, he said, who is Lord Jagannath? He said, Lord Jagannath is Sham Sundar. That's who he was seeing. He'd see Sham Sundar. So, we say the deity is non-different from Krishna, but it doesn't mean everybody sees it. We say the holy name is non-different from Krishna, but it doesn't mean everyone who chants it has that realization. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and Prabhupada sometimes would say, just saying the name is not the name. Just repeating the syllables. Because that's only done with the mouth. And so, we all have practical experience of this. Because sometimes you chant one round really well and you get really inspired. How many of you have had that experience? Like one really good round, and it's like amazing. It's like almost like you were sitting with Krishna, isn't it? And how many of you have chanted 16 bad rounds and didn't even feel as empowered or enlivened as that one good round? Yeah. So that's, that's proof of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's statement. Just mere recitation is not the name. That you weren't connected with the name. That one good round you were connected. You had an amazing experience. So it could be like, if we use the example of the deity, someone who doesn't see Krishna as the deity, and they're standing looking at the deity for an hour, and nothing happens. Because they're not seeing the deity. Although Krishna's, Krishna's in his name, but you're, but you're not experiencing it, because you're in process, not in relationship. Does that make sense? So... Another way of looking at it is that japa can be seen as a conversation. And why would I say conversation? Well, we had just given the example that Prabhupada said one of the meanings of the name is Krishna, please accept me. So we'll use that example to illustrate this point. If that's one of the meanings, and while we're chanting, we are feeling that. That's the meaning to us while I'm chanting. So when I'm chanting Hare Krishna, what's going on for me inside is Krishna, please accept me. That's the feeling. So that's a conversation. That means I'm expressing. I'm expressing something to Krishna. Right? Does that make sense? I'm expressing a feeling. I want to be accepted. So that's my end of the conversation. And if you're attentive to the holy name, then you'll be able to experience Krishna's end of the conversation where you can feel Krishna 
accepting you, or you can feel Krishna's presence, or you feel some internal guidance. Now, one time Prabhupada said, when you call Krishna, Hare Krishna, then Krishna comes because you've called. And he asks you, what do you want? Just like Nat Levi was calling you. I kept calling you. Then at some point you'd say, yes, what do you want? That's natural. So he said, so Prabhupada said, Krishna's doing the same thing. When you're chanting, you're calling, and he's asking, what do you want? And so this is, this is very important. Because right now, I would like to ask you, today when you were chanting your japa, what were you wanting? What was going on for you? What were you wanting? Because... You're now in conversation with Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. That means expressing what you want. So, so Prabhupada said, you're calling Krishna. Krishna's asking what you want. So through the holy name, you express what you want. Which means your spiritual aspirations. So just take a moment right now and think, during this morning's japa, what were you asking for? Maybe some of you might say, I wasn't asking for anything. I was just trying to get my rounds done. Right? Which, which I, I, I would, I understand why that happens, but to me that's kind of mindless. Or you could say heartless. It's just, it's like neutral. It's like, you know, you tell your wife, I love you, and she says, what were you thinking? What were you thinking when you said, I love you? Nothing. <coughs> that would be weird, wouldn't it? You, were th you said you love me and you were thinking nothing? Yeah, I wasn't. I was just saying it. Well, why are you saying it? Because I'm supposed to. Because my father <laughs> said every day I should tell my wife I love her. That would be weird, wouldn't it? So why is that any weirder than chanting Hare Krishna and when we're, you're asked what were you feeling or what were you thinking, you say nothing. Isn't that weird? Does that sound weird also? Now, unfortunately, what happens when we chant in process is we don't get taste because there's not taste in process. There's taste in relationship. So you might get a little taste from process, but if it's too mechanical, the real the ta you're getting like a taste of, of accomplishment or of ritual, but not so much relationship and emotion. You know what I mean? It's like you finish a job, there's some satisfaction of accomplishment. But if you love your boss, and you're doing it to please him, it's going to be a higher experience. Isn't it? So, quite often, if we look at japa as a process, then we'll tend to look at it more as a chore than a relationship. Because, you know, this is, this is what you do if you want to go back to Godhead. You do this process, and you do it every day. So when you divorce it from relationship, it starts to become a chore. And the problem is, if it becomes a chore, then if I ask you, what were you thinking when you were chanting, you'll probably say, I was just thinking, when's it going to be finished? I was thinking nothing, and then about the 14th round, I started thinking, when's it going to be over? Or the 8th round? Or, you know. That's a symptom of process, because there's no, there's no relationship. Just like if a man and a woman are in love, they always want to be together. So wherever she wants to go, wherever he wants to go, they'll just go. They want to be together. That's, isn't it? Like... Guys don't like shopping. They may like shopping alone, but they don't really like shopping with their wives because what their wives want doesn't interest them. And they have to pay for it. So it's, you know, it's not really high on their list of priorities. But if they're in love, you'll love to go shopping. Right? Isn't it? 
And if he's just, and if they're, you know, been married a long time and they're not, they don't have that fresh love, and he's just going shopping to be nice, then what's he, you know, after a couple hours, he'll just say, when are we leaving? Right? That's process. You know, how much longer? Where if they're in love, he doesn't say how much longer. He's just happy to be with her. Right? So that's why we're looking at when, you know, how many rounds do I have left? When will it be over? Because it's more process. It's more duty. Okay, it's my duty to accompany my wife, make her happy, but I don't want to. I, I'm just bored, you know. She's looking at earrings. and Earrings really don't excite me that much, to tell you the truth. So I get bored. You know, she's looking at saris. Honey, you have 437 saris. I counted them before we went out. Yes, but I don't have this sari. This is really special. That doesn't like really, it's not really stimulate men, you know. It just bores them, kind of. They don't understand that. You have to take birth as a woman, probably, to understand it. I mean, you could try to understand it. It would be easier if you're a woman. So, that's what happens in process. And so, you don't want to chant in process. You want to chant in relationship. So, Prabhupada has given us this, this really nice question for us to meditate on. Krishna is asking you, what do you want? So, when you're chanting, you're expressing what you want. So, now let's go around the room and have some of you share. If Krishna asks you, what do you want, what would you say? Uh, don't say, I want a new car, any of that. We're talking about spiritual, you know, your spiritual desires. What, what, would, you, what would you ask? Someone can give me something? What would you ask for? Engagement. I just want to be engaged in your service. I never want to be engaged in my service. Empower me to do this service. Bless me with more service. Like that. Yes. What else would you ask for? Getting rid of anarthas. Relieve me of my anarthas. Relieve me of my obstacles. Anything that's getting in the way of the relationship, please. Remove that. I just want... I just want the clear path to serve you. I want nothing else in my heart, only love. Yes. What else? Let me remember you. What else? Accept me back. Accept me? Accept me back in your service. Another prayer is make me qualified to be a servant, to be your servant. What else? Give me your shelter so I always remain in Krishna consciousness so I never foolishly think of leaving you. Right, what else? Yes. Pada duli, sadhusham vichintaya. Keep me as an atom at your lotus feet. Don't kick me away. Yeah, okay, so that's the idea. Now, the, the question always comes up when we talk about expressing desire while chanting. The natural question comes up, I thought we were just supposed to chant and hear. What are the deities Radha Krishna names? Radha Krishna Chandra Kija and Nitai what? Nitai Chaitanya. Radha Krishna Chandra, Nitai Chaitanya, Shringa Bhagavan. Lakshmi and Shringa? Kija. Kora Bhakta Vrinda Kija. So, I'm sure many of you are thinking, this always comes up. I'm supposed to chant and just hear. Now, if I have to think about all these things we just said, Krishna, accept me, remove my anarthas, engage me in your service, and so on, it seems to be contradictory to the instruction that I should just hear. And it also seems <coughs> that I would have to keep thinking those things, and that would distract me from chanting. Right? Anybody think like that? 
Okay. The first thing is that everything that you're asking for can be expressed emotionally. And emotions are not thought, they're felt, and it's expressed through feelings. Right? So, I hate to give these mundane examples, but somehow or other, I guess I mean mundane consciousness. But if a boy asks a girl to marry her, and he says, will you marry me? Is he thinking, will you marry me? Or is he feeling, will you marry me? What's, what is, what's going on? The feeling or the... Does he have it on a piece of paper? Will you marry me? Does he have to remember that? Does he have to he keep going over, his head, over and over in his head? Okay, I'm supposed to say, will you marry me? No. But because it's a feeling, it, nat it comes out naturally. And he's not thinking what to say. It just comes out. Right? That's how emotions work. They're not formulated in the mind, but they're felt. So when we say, when Krishna says, what do you want, and then you're expressing it through the holy name, it's not that you're thinking it, it's you're feeling it. For example, Krishna, please accept me. What would be the difference between thinking that and feeling it? Krishna, please accept me as a thought would be more something like, well, this is the right thing to say. You know, this is like, it's, it goes back to process. Right? This is the right. Mahatma Prabhu told us we should pray, Krishna, please accept me. So I like to get everything right, and I've written it down on a piece of paper, and I put it, put it in front of me when I chant, and this is what I'm going to think. Now, that, that goes back to process. But if you take that, Krishna, please accept me, and you're chanting, you're not even thinking, Krishna, please accept me. You're just feeling, Krishna, please accept me. Then there's no contradiction of how do I focus on the holy name because you're not in your head, but you're in your heart. Hare Krishna. Right, let's try it. Let's, let's do an experiment now. We want to chant not with the thought, Krishna, please accept me, but we want to chant with the feeling, Krishna, please accept me. And what's the feeling? The feeling is, I left you, I want to come back to you, and now I'm asking you, begging you humbly. I don't deserve it, but I'm begging and asking, would you please accept me, because I want to come back in the relationship. So that's the feeling. So let's chant together. We'll chant in unison. We'll do japa in unison for a few mantras. And we'll just try to imbibe the feeling without thinking it. Just feeling it. Krishna, please accept me. Does anyone have any question? Is anyone confused how you can feel it and not think it? Because if you are, I'll explain it more. Because it's, it, you, the exercise won't work well if you are confused. Oh, okay. Um, he's saying, even if I say I love you, and I feel it, if I say it 1,728 times, it'll become mechanical. Maybe, depends how much you love her. <laughs> because you could say, you know, look at it this way. We can write a song right now. You say, I love you so much, no matter how much I say it, it's not enough. If you really loved her that much, I don't think you'd get tired of it. That's because you don't love her enough. That's why. You see, we are conditioned. So, Mahaprabhu said always chant. Why should we always chant? Because we need help all the time. So, because we need help all the time, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, just keep chanting, you have free time, keep chanting, you finish your 16 rounds, keep chanting, because we always need help. So we're always asking Krishna, help me, accept me, engage me, remove my anarthas. So as long as we have those requests, as long as we need those things, we'll never tire of asking, because we'll always have to ask. And then when Krishna fulfills those desires, then by that time we'll have taste, and then we'll chant because we like to. Right? 
Um, there was one Buddhist, he said something that I appreciated. He said his guru gave him a mantra and told him to chant so many times, like hours and hours a day. And he was wondering, why so much? And then he realized that, you know, for millions of lifetimes I've had these patterns of thoughts. So I have to always be chanting to undo the patterns. So I can never really chant enough because I'm trying to counteract all those patterns. So that's why we're always chanting, because we the pattern is going this way and we want it to go this way. Or it's going this way, we want it to go that way. Is that okay? Does anyone else have any question? Yes. That thinking, how can you feel? Okay. I have to do the boyfriend girlfriend example. <coughs> Your girlfriend, who you're going to marry, has gone to America for a year. And now she's at the airport. And it's the first time you see her. Are you thinking or are you feeling? <laughs> you're not thinking anything, are you? You're just feeling, isn't it? So when feeling is strong, because feeling is a subtle form of thinking, so it just takes over. The feeling takes over the thinking. So you're not thinking, I'm so happy to see you. You're feeling, you're feeling it, right? Maybe while you're going to the airport, you go, I'm so happy to see her, I can't wait to see her. But when you finally see her, the feelings overwhelm you. So then you're disguided by emotion. And the emotion, if you had to explain the emotion, you would just say, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by seeing her. I'm so happy to see her. That's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling intense happiness. Does that make sense? So, think of feeling as a subtle form of thought. Like Krishna says, Dayato Vishayam Punsam. From meditation comes attachment, Sangat, and then Sangat, from Sangat comes Kama, lust. So sometimes you think, but you don't feel. Right? Like, Let's say you see a, a guy in a beautiful Italian suit and you look at it and say, that's a nice suit. But you have no desire to wear that suit. So there's no emotion. You, you go to work in a t-shirt and jeans and that's what you like. So you can recognize thinking, yeah, it's a nice colors, it's a nice material, but there's no emotion. There's no desire for it. So it's simply thinking. But if you look at the suit and then you start feeling emotions, so I'd like a suit like that, that's really beautiful. It's a beautiful color, the way it's cut is beautiful. The tie perfectly matches. There's an experience there. You start to feel something. Thinking, feeling. And then from the feeling, you start thinking, you go up to the guy and go, where'd you get that suit? I want to get one. If thinking, feeling, well, I have to have that suit. I've never seen a suit so beautiful, right? So when you get to the point, I have to have the suit, it's all feeling. It's no, it's no longer thinking, right? You ever, you, know, you ever been in a position where you have to have something and you figure out how to do it and you don't even know how you figured it out? It's totally on the emotional level. It's just you're operating on emotion and you, you, you get there. You feel like there, there's a saying that if you can't speak someone's language, but the house is on fire, you'll be able to communicate it. Right? Because it's all emotion. So that's how it works. Thinking detached from emotion, there's no, there's no sangha. Right? And in advertising, it's try, advertising starts with getting you thinking, but it has to create emotion. If it doesn't create emotion, you won't buy it, because there'll be no attachment. So advertising is all about creating emotion. Right? And then you start feeling like, I have to have this. Right? You feel it, right? When you're going to buy something, where do you feel it? Right here, huh? I've got to have this. This is, this is the thing, I need to have it. And your credit card comes out. Right? It's the emotion that gets the credit card out of your wallet. Not, you know, I mean, if it's, something, if it's something you need and you've thought about, and if there's no emotion involved, it's just practical, that's different. But if it's something you don't need, then you buy it because of emotion, right? It's only emotion. So 
that Dayato Vishaya and Pungsam verse is actually what advertising marketing people follow. They don't realize that. But meditate on it, get them attached to it. If they stay attached long enough, then they'll buy it. Do you know, I don't know about here, but in grocery stores in America, all the things you need, like milk and bread and all the main things that people buy, are in the back of the store. Did you know that? And all the things that kids want are on the bottom shelves because it's eye level to the kids. And they calculated that like every minute you stay in the store, you will buy a certain amount, you will put in your cart a certain dollar amount of products. So the longer they can keep you in the store, the more you'll buy. Dieto Vishayam Pungsam. Sangha. You know, look at it long enough, get attached to it, then attached to it long enough, you have to have it. It evolves into lust. So, we can apply that process to japa, where you're going from the thinking stage to the feeling. So, I'm not just thinking, oh, Krishna, please accept me. I'm feeling, Krishna, please accept me. So, <clears throat> so just like when you see your girlfriend after a year... <coughs> She's been away for a year. It's all feeling. It's not thinking. And then she comes and you hug and you don't think, am I hugging her the right way? Is it too hard? Is it too soft? You're not in your head. You don't think that way. You only feel. Right? So if you can come to that position when you're chanting to express all the things that we just said here, if they could be expressed through feeling, then your, your japa will now be in relationship. It'll be expressing what you want from Krishna. And if you express it that deeply, certainly Krishna will reciprocate. But if you just chant japa and there's, there's nothing going on, then do you ever, you ever feel like you finish your rounds and you feel like, there was, like Krishna wasn't even there? It was like it could have chanted Coca-Cola? That's why, because you weren't in relationship. So there was... You weren't really addressing, you know, we're treating the holy name like a process, so there's nothing, there's no one to reciprocate. You weren't asking for anything, right? The only thing you're asking for is to help me get my rounds done. Right? Or help me not be so bored. Help me get through this two hours of torture, you know, without being tortured by it. Something, something like that. Does that make sense? So... I'd like you, oh, we're, let's use this meditation. Krishna, please accept me. That's going to be our meditation right now. And we're going to try to just feel it and not think it. We'll go from thinking to feeling. And so what's the feeling? I'm here in the material world. I've turned my back on Krishna. I'm chanting the Maha Mantra, asking Krishna, begging Krishna, please accept me back in relationship. I've left you. I'm frustrated. I've suffered. I'm repentant, remorseful. Please accept me back in relationship. Can we try that? Okay. So don't think. Turn your mind off. Put the off button on your mind and go into your heart. Turn the on button in your heart, the off button in your mind. Actually, if you, if you get the on button in your heart, the off button automatically goes off in your mind. And if you turn the mind button on, or you put the off button in your heart, the mind button goes off. It starts, goes back to its thinking platform instead of the subtle feeling. Okay, are we ready? Can we do it? Okay, let's try. Actually, why don't we all just take out our beads? And everyone out uh, watching this, you can also take out your beads. And you can do the exercise. Because um, the real, the best thing is going to be to actually do it properly. Okay, so let's let's chant about ten or twenty rounds, and then we'll. Uh, you'll have so much ecstasy chanting, I won't be able to stop you. But anyway, I'll I'll try my best to stop you. Okay, just yeah. You don't have any beads. Shami ki jai. So yeah, let's chant a little bit, and. Uh, I'll just interrupt you and then we'll continue our class.
Krishna, please accept me. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari 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 Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari Hari Ram Hari Ram Ram Hari 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 Krishna Hari Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Ram Hari 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 Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari Hari Ram Hari Ram Ram Hari Hari Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari Hari Ram Hari Ram Ram Hari Hari Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari Hari Ram Hari Ram Ram Hari Hari Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari Hari Ram Hari Ram Ram Hari Hari Krishna Hari Hare 
Okay, so I would like to ask any of you who would like to share, just to share your experience or realization, or if this, this kind of chat, chanting is different than the way you chanted this morning, and how it was different, and what you experienced, or anything you'd like to share. Was it better? Was it worse? Did you have trouble doing it? This was better. This was better. Why? In the morning I was chanting in isolation. Here in association, there was a vibration on and on. Off and on. It kept me more engaged, more focused. Sadhu Sangha Ki Jai. When do you... Um, chant with other devotees, then you get to <coughs> pick up on their devotion also. You can fly on their devotion a little bit. Who else would like to share? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
makes us feel connected to Krishna. <laughs> yeah, he's saying that this makes him feel connected to Krishna, and if that connection is not there, then you sleep, which is just another way of saying you get bored. Right? You know, I've said many times, I don't have a Shastric reference, but I, I think indirectly I have a Shastric reference, that sometimes Prabhupada would say, Two people who say, well, you're just, you could chant anything and you could convince yourself that it's going to do something and it'll do something. So then Prabhupada would say, well, why don't you take a mantra like Coca-Cola and experiment and see what it does. And so obviously it would be boring to chant Coca-Cola, right? I mean, we don't have to try well, we can imagine how boring it would be to chant Coca-Cola. But sometimes I think that when we're chanting the Maha Mantra and we're only in process, that the experience we have is similar to chanting Coca-Cola because Krishna is obviously absent from chanting Coca-Cola. But we can chant and Krishna could be absent in the Maha Mantra and then we feel almost as if we're chanting some other mantra. Does that make sense? You have that experience? You know, so you, you think, this Maha Mantra is so powerful, why is it not working on me? Why does it feel like it could have been any mantra, it could have been anything, I could have made it up? Because we're not in relationship. I mean, obviously there's benefit there, there's no question. But we're not accessing the full benefit. Who else would like to share? Yes. Oh, you lost track of time? Yeah. If um, the more conscious you are of time, that's a sign that you're not absorbed. You're with your this girl or your friend or someone that you love. You lose track of time. You do what you like. You lose track of time. So that's a symptom that you're chanting well, you, you're not concerned about time. Sometimes you'll chant, you know, you'll finish four rounds and you, you feel like it was five or ten minutes. You're not aware. That's a good sign. Time flies when you're having fun. And what's the other saying? Time stands still when you're not having fun? Yeah, something like that. What else? Yes. Nice. And do you feel anything from him? Yes, I feel peaceful. Uh -huh. You know, Krishna reciprocates. So the more you, well, the, you, you know, there's it's often there's this I don't feel anything. You know, someone will say, Prabhu, when I chant, I don't feel anything. It comes up all the time in Japa workshops. And what's, what's the most interesting thing about this statement, I think, is it's like what you said, you were, you were feeling, but what were you feeling? You were feeling the emotion you put into it. Right? And then Krishna's feeling was reciprocal to your emotion. So a lot of times when devotees say, I'm not feeling anything, what they're saying is, I'm not feeling any reciprocation from Krishna. But the reality is, they're not putting any emotion into it. Because, Jagannath Swami Kija. For example, if you did this exercise properly, and you put a lot of emotion into it, you wouldn't say, I wasn't feeling anything. Even if you didn't feel anything coming from Krishna, you felt it coming from you. Correct? So you wouldn't say, I'm not feeling anything, because you're putting your emotion into it. So you're feeling a lot. Right? Don't you find that interesting? You say, I'm not feeling anything. 
I'm not feeling anything is an autobiographical statement. That, let's reword that statement. I'm not feeling anything is, I'm not putting anything into my japa. That's what really you're saying. And you're expecting the holy name to reciprocate, so you're not feeling anything from the holy name, you're expecting it to reciprocate, but you haven't put anything into it. And so, if you chant praying to Krishna, sincerely, with feeling, you would never say, I'm not feeling anything. It's only when you stop doing that would you say, I'm not feeling anything. Does that make sense? And as long as you're feeling something, you'll, you'll, Krishna will reciprocate and you'll feel that mercy of the Holy Name. Yes. By feeling and not... If, as long as you're not feeling, the mind's going to wander. As long as you're not praying, the mind will wander. The Maha Mantra is a prayer. You do it as process, then you're simply straining to control your mind, which is impossible. And the only way you can control your mind is do something artificial, like do pranayama or something. So while you're doing pranayama, you'll get some equilibrium, and then when you stop, your mind will start oscillating. But when you pray, then the mind goes into its subtle aspect of feeling, and then the thinking process is subdued. You don't have to try to control it, because it won't be oscillating. Just like think of any high emotional experience you have. That emotional experience, it fixes your consciousness. The experience is all-encompassing. Right? Let's say there's a beautiful sky and a beautiful sunset, like something you've never seen before. It's purple, it's pink, it's orange, it's phenomenal, and, and you're with someone. You say, look at that, that's amazing, and you're feeling incredible emotion. Your mind is, everything, everything your consciousness is fixed on that, isn't it? So as your emotion is higher, your consciousness fixes on it. When your emotion weakens, then your mind will start, because your mind needs something to focus on. Now, in a more advanced stage of Krishna consciousness, where attraction to Krishna is very strong, naturally the mind will go there, because the mind goes to what it's attracted to. Right? Wherever you have the most love and affection and attraction, that's where your mind goes. That's why some people only think of money, because that's what they love, and they can't stop thinking about it. And you don't have to tell them, think of money. They'll always think about it. That's what they're attracted to. So on a higher stage of bhakti, naturally the mind will go to Krishna because it's attracted to Krishna. Or just like you think of the food you like to eat. It's natural. But in our stage, we want to arouse the emotion because when that emotion... If you chant as we were doing and you were trying to control your mind, that means you weren't feeling it. Because if you're feeling it, you don't have to control, try to control your mind because your mind will be subdued by the emotion. Whenever emotion is strong, the mind is subdued. Whenever emotion is weak, then the mind becomes more active. Does that make sense? Because it's a prayer. Like for example, let's say your mother was very ill. So you came to the temple to pray to the deity. Say, please, my mother's critically ill, she could die, please save her. There would be no question of, of having to control your mind. The emotion that you're experiencing is so intense that she could die at any moment and you feel, this is my only chance to pray to Krishna. Nobody can save her. If Lord Nishringadev saves her, it's the only chance. So your emotion is so high, there's no question of, of your mind wandering. It would be impossible. You couldn't think of anything else. That's how emotion fixes the mind. It, just, it fixes consciousness. It fixes attention. You know, when you say your mind is wandering, what's wandering is not your mind, it's your attention. That's what's wandering. You're distract, get, you get distracted. So your attention is wandering. Your mind has millions of things it could think about, and you can draw your attention to any number of things. And so when emotion is high, your attention gets drawn into that emotional experience. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, because those emotions are not engaged in japa. Those are just your... You see, when you... Okay, we'll go back to the idea that japa is a relationship. So let's say you and I have a relationship. So we make an appointment to go out somewhere. And I only come to Bangalore once a year, and this is going to be the only time you see me. So it's pretty important. And you've got like things that are bothering you. But when I come in order to respect the relationship and that small amount of time, you're there present for me, you give me your attention. Because it would be, it would ruin the relationship, it also would be impolite if you're just completely distracted and I'm talking to you and you don't hear anything. So, when you're chanting japa, you're giving yourself to the relationship. So no matter what's going on in your life, at that moment, you have to have the the uh, focus or the, the internal control to turn it off so you can do your job because if you don't you won't, you'll ruin your japa so it's it's disrespectful to the japa to be somewhere else just as it would be disrespectful to a friend to not be present with them when you're together so that's something that we have to consciously think of when we're chanting japa that now I'm doing this I have to give quality time to the holy name. Because if you don't do that and your mind's disturbed, then your mind will always distract you. Does that make sense? It's like you have to you have to bargain and reason with your mind. Okay, no, I know you're disturbed, but now this is what we're doing. It's like a shift in consciousness. For example, let's say you were a bus driver. So and you're driving at rush hour and the bus is full, hundreds of people. So their lives, in a sense, are in your hands. So no matter what's going on in your life, when you get behind the wheel, you have to focus. Well, let's use another example. You're an airplane pilot. So no matter what's going on in your life, you get in that seat, you, have to fo you just have to turn everything off because this is, this is serious business. And if you're distracted, well, let's use another example. You're, a, you're one of those, one of those guys that control, air traffic controller. I think there's more chance you're going to crash because they make a mistake than the pilot, because the plane's mostly automatic anyway. You're an air traffic controller, and you're disturbed, but when you drive to your work and you get in that seat, you have to focus, because you can't do your job if you're not focused. If you make, you know what they say? If... If air traffic controllers are not 100% on, if they're only 99%, there'll be like two airplane crashes a day. Yeah, so they have to be completely absorbed. So, and there are many jobs like that. You can be anywhere in your head, but when it comes time to do the work, you have to focus on it, otherwise you can't do it. So we have to do the same thing with jumping. <coughs> Wherever we're going, what's ever going on emotionally, at least at this time, I have to give it to Krishna. And if we don't do that, if we don't make the shift, then, yeah, your mind will... It's, it's virtually impossible to control the mind unless you create the right environment before you chant. Because if you don't create that environment, you're giving your mind... The, you're allowing your mind to take you because you haven't, you haven't processed what's going on inside of you in a way that you can discipline it enough to chant. So then it'll, it'll just take you. And you'll chant, but you won't be present. In Buddhism, they call it mindfulness. Be present to what you're experiencing at this moment. So that takes, sometimes we have to make a big effort. It takes, it takes a conscious effort that all these things are going on. Just like right now, two nights ago, I think it was, we got everybody to agree that when you chant japa at night, it's always going to be bad. Those of you who are here remember that, right? I said, Japa at night is bad. Everybody said, yeah, it's bad, right? Did you have a good Japa now? Was it possible? So what did we do? We prepped you. We got you in the right consciousness, right? So we put ourselves in the right consciousness, and then we chanted. 
So no matter what was going on in your life, I was trying to get you focused on your relationship with Krishna so you could chant good japa. So that's what we have to do before we chant. So whatever is going on in your life, you kind of want to put it on hold and then bring in all the right moods for chanting. Otherwise, you'll just be chanting, but you won't be present. You'll be present to something negative that's going on. That's what you'll be present to. Right? Now, if something negative is going on, you could also use that in your japa, use that negative energy to pray to Krishna to help you. Krishna, I'm disturbed. Please help me. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So you could help me overcome this problem. You could use it that way. If you just can't control it, you can use it to empower you to pray. Yes. Well, the Shastras say the significance of Nama Parad is that it will only give you material benefit, but I think the idea of saying keep chanting is that if you keep chanting, then there's a chance you'll chant Nama Vas. You know, it's like you're drowning in the ocean, but you don't know how to swim, but just keep paddling, keep your head above water, and there's a chance a boat can come. And, you know. So that's the idea. Don't stop chanting, because by continually chanting, the hope is, the idea is, you will come to the stage of Nama Bas. Now, if you stop chanting, then how will you come to the stage of Nama Bas? Having said that, my personal experience is, if you continually chant Nama Parad, it becomes a habit. And the more you do it, the more difficult it is to overcome. So it's true, we should continue chanting. But... What the Shastra actually says is that if you make an offense to the Holy Name, you should continue chanting. But you should continue chanting without offense. That's what it actually says. Because by continually chanting with offense, it's like you're exasperating the problem. You're reinforcing it. So nobody should think, well, I'll just keep chanting with offense and I'll get better, because the actual injunction is continue chanting without offense. In fact, continue chanting with remorse for having made offense. That's what, it, what Bhaktivinoda Thakur said. Because it's remorseful, so it's corrective. But if you keep doing it the wrong way, you know, let's say you play golf and you have a swing that's bad. And the more you use that swing, the more you imbibe that bad habit. So, you know, so should you just keep playing golf and you'll get better? You should keep playing golf, but do it the right way. And if you keep playing the wrong way, it's going to be harder and harder to do it the right way. And then one of the definitions that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur gave of Nama Parad is Nama Parad is chanting without making an effort to overcome the Aparads. So if I'm just chanting, but I'm not trying to avoid the offenses, that's considered Nama Parad. As long as I'm trying to, making the effort to avoid the offense, then it's Nama Bas. So therefore, the rectification is keep chanting with the effort to avoid the offense. Is that clear? But it's really, you know, some devotees kind of, they don't chant well. And if you don't chant well for a period of time, then you start to think, you can't chant well. So then you just chant bad, but at least you chant your rounds. Your 16 rounds, but you do them bad. So the danger is that this just becomes a way you're going to chant your whole life. And every time you chant poorly, it reconfirms that you can't chant well. And then that it embeds that bad habit. Does that make sense? So that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous. Not dangerous only because you're not getting the result of chanting a more pure name, but you're making it hard. The longer you do it, the more difficult it is to, to get out of it. And that's why normally, or at least when Sachin Swami started the um, 
japa work the japa retreats that um he did them for like five or six days because all these habits are bad habits over the years you needed day after day after day after day of chanting and talking about chanting to to reorient yourself into better habits you know a couple days of 64 rounds extra rounds every day talking about how to improve looking at the bad habits all these things so that was my experience from doing the japa workshops is that if i don't chant well it reinforces a bad habit so you know let's say you go home tonight and you have five rounds left and you know you get home at 9:30 and those rounds aren't going to be very good because you're tired or you can't focus whatever the problem is the problem is that you chant those bad five rounds it's just embedding that bad habit it's just you know how habits work they're subconscious so every bad rad every bad round we chant kind of empowers us to chant more bad rounds every good round we chant empowers us to chant good rounds as is true for any habit isn't it so every time you do something the wrong way you're more inclined next time to do it the wrong way and vice versa so that's that's the problem of just getting your rounds done because then you become accustomed to just getting them done and then just getting them done becomes normal and what we should strive for is to chant good rounds every day and then make that normal because the reality is when you develop a good habit then the good habit becomes normal and so at least my experience is that if you develop good japa habits you'll just chant better rounds automatically you won't even have to try that just becomes the way you do it and that's fantastic if you can come to that level would that be good that like the norm just like look at your life the norm you have a normal way of doing things and some of the things that you do which are normal you do very well you always do them well because that your normal is is to do it good so wouldn't that be good with japa that you you automatically do it good because you've practiced so much i was listening to this lecture about practice and this um this person made a very good point he said whatever you practice you get good at so if you're an angry person you're always getting angry which means you get really good at getting angry because you're always practicing it because you're doing it all the time isn't that an interesting way of looking at it but it's true isn't it you're always getting angry that means you're practicing anger all the time and therefore anger just becomes normal for you or you practice not being angry so that becomes normal so whatever level of japa we're striving for whatever level we're committed to on a daily basis becomes our habit so if we're committed to improving you can get to a point where it becomes your habit to chant good japa and it virtually becomes impossible not to chant good japa wouldn't that be nice like you you couldn't actually chant bad japa it's just it's your habit is so good that bad japa doesn't happen and you can see that with advanced devotees don't you notice that like when they chant japa they're just not going to chant bad japa it's like it's not part of who they are they don't they just don't do it because they've been habituated to go deeply into their japa so they don't really have to try it's just how they do it does that make sense yeah so that's really the whole point of any class or any workshop on japa is to help us come to this point where when you start chanting automatically you're chanting on a very high and pure level that's just how you chant but you have to work to get there but if you keep working on it steadily over time that becomes your default setting and we all have default settings right so some of us chant good japa some of us chant excellent some of us chant okay some of us chant not so okay some of us chant bad and is we just tend to repeat that because that's the way habits work i mean sometimes you you know you have good days really special sometimes you have bad days but for most of us 
it's within a certain realm, you know, of poor, okay, average, good, excellent, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So when we try to feel, then uh, where does this hearing of Holy Name come? From? You weren't hearing when you were chanting now? Yeah. What were you hearing? Actually, uh, what I was experiencing was after some mantras, I was losing the feeling. Yes. So I was trying to meditate on the slow, like, please try to attention. Yeah. So attention goes there in trying to remember that slow and I was done trying to hear this. Mm-hmm. So what's more important? Feeling or hearing? Someone could say by hearing you'll get the feeling. But if the goal is to get the feeling, you have to keep practicing. Because if you do it right, you'll have way more than hearing. You'll have complete absorption. Totally, head to toe. Inside, outside. I don't know how to express that, total absorption, but I think the best way to express it is like a shield of the holy name, it's surrounding you, and it's, there's nothing but the holy name. So that's like a magnified stage of hearing, it's not just in here, it's everywhere, and you're experiencing it all over your body, inside, it's just, you're surrounded by the holy name. That's the idea. If expressing emotion, that's what you'll feel like. So it'll be way more than just hearing. But if for you, hearing is easy and it's absorbing, then you do that. And then by hearing, you'll feel also. It'll come. The, the only concern or warning I would give is that if you're a person who by nature is very mechanistic, you look at the world very me- mechanistically, everything's about proper rules, timings, and so forth, then when we say just here, you'll tend to process it in a more mechanical way. And then you'll think, if I'm hearing, I'm doing it properly. And you may actually turn off everything else and just hear, and you know, and, you know then it looks something like, like it, it might look some, be a little unnatural when you're chanting. You know, it's like, you know, it's like you just turn into a robot or something, you know. It's just not normal, you know. So that's just a, to something to consider, that you could, you know, be a little too mechanical or robotic in the name of I'm trying to hear. Because it is Krishna and it is a relationship and you can't, you don't want to forget that. Yes? In Prabhupada books, he many times says, like Prabhupada writes, just chant and hear what is your difficulty. So what, what the context of the conversation was, the devotee said, I can't f- concentrate, I can't focus. I can't control my mind. And the Prabhupada said, where's the question of mind? Like you're not, you're not chanting with your mind. You're just hearing and chanting. But I would say, you can also understand that if Prabhupada's saying, where's the question of mind? But he's saying... But in many places, he said that the whole point is to feel. So you don't need your mind. You can express it through feeling, through prayer. I can't control my mind. Where's the question of mind? Why worry about the mind? You don't need the, you don't need the mind. But you definitely need your heart, for sure. And you need to be praying, or ideally be praying. That's the idea. So I think... What I think where we get caught up in is those of us who are more mechanistic when we hear that just here, then we it like activates all our mechanical ways of approaching spiritual life. You know, it, it like reinforces it. And I don't think that's what Prabhupada meant. I don't think he meant become a robot when you chant. But some of us we tend to be a little bit like that. But so maybe it's our personality, maybe it's our culture, I don't know, our upbringing. So when we hear those things, it can activate a very mechanistic approach to japa, because that's our nature. So you just have to be careful. And then 
It's all about hearing. It's not about praying. It's not about feeling. It's not about relationship. It's not about appreciating the holy name. It's none of those things. It's not about experience. It's just about hearing. And I think that's unfortunate if we interpret it that way. And I know a lot of devotees preach, you know, just here, because that's what Prabhupada said. But I, I feel that there's a misunderstanding sometimes. Uh, like we were saying yesterday, for example, we were talking about low self-esteem, and we were saying, if someone has low self-esteem and you talk about humility, it, makes, it, 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 it plays into their low self-esteem, and it makes them feel worse. But we're supposed to preach about humility, but if we do it in the wrong way, we can actually make people feel worse, who already feel bad about themselves because they have certain emotional problems. Then you talk about, you're, you should be, you know, feel lower than this, and you know, where you're just wretched and this and that. But they already feel that way, not because they're Krishna conscious, but because they have some emotional problems. So then talking about it makes it worse. So I feel, you know, that has to be explained to people, what does it mean to be humble, how to be humble, how to deal with your low self-esteem. So in the same way, if we just say just here, there's got to be more explanation of what, what's entailed in that. Otherwise, the people who tend to be proper, ritualistic, mechanical, will just, they'll take that and they'll, be very, they'll tend to be a little bit robotic and mechanical. Yeah. Oh, that, that'll take another 50 years. <laughs> Humility comes slow. But um, any shift you want to make, you, you, you begin by making the shift by understanding the value of achieving that, whatever it is you want to achieve. So in this case, we're talking about humility. So I want to achieve a state of humility. But I can't just achieve it overnight because I have an ego which is conditioned. But if I have the desire, then from the desire will come the desire to practice humility. So I'm practicing acts of humility before it fully manifests. If I don't have a desire, I don't even want to act in a humble way. So the desire has to be there. So you study the philosophy, you understand the importance of humility, you understand how destructive pride is, you develop some attraction for it, even though it may not be something you feel on an emotional level, but the attraction is more intellectual. But at least there's enough attraction that you want to practice it. And then you begin practicing humility, like serving others, appreciating others. Even you don't feel like it, but you do it, because that's how it develops. It develops through action. And the mistake people make is that they don't act until they feel it. So they don't act humbly until they feel it. And they think, well, later on when I'm Krishna conscious and I feel it, I can act it. But the reality is the actions will make you feel it. Whereas if you wait to feel it, to act, who knows how long that's going to take. You understand? So we develop, through knowledge we develop a desire from the desire, we perform actions, humble actions, and those humble actions start to change us internally. That's what changes us. It's the humble actions. Yes? But the reality is, we have devotees 20 years who are still bored to death when they chant. So where's the feeling? It hasn't come yet. So the point is that, you see, the point is that just hearing is practically <coughs> impossible for most people. To control the mind is practically impossible. If you don't have some connection with Krishna and some feeling because it's a prayer, that's practically impossible. It just, it just becomes very mechanical, artificial. Um, it just, it's just so much harder to come to a, a stage, a better stage of chanting that way. And, uh, you know, 
you'll, and, and it's hard to be consistent in that. Because what if one day your mind's disturbed? Then you can't hear. Same way, I would, I would study everything about the detriments of anger. I would meditate on the benefits of being forgiving, accepting. I would discover what's underlying the anger. There may be many things underlying it. I would work on that. When you understand the destructive nature of any emotion you have, it will start to turn you around. We talked about this a couple of days ago. In, in, you know, if somebody's angry, right? That means they'll tell you, I don't like to get angry, right? An angry person will say, I, mean, I get angry, but I don't like to. But I don't believe that. Because if you didn't like to, you would stop it. And so, what I would say to that person is, I don't believe that you don't want to, and you have to come to the point where you don't want to before you can control it. Because you really, you don't want to, maybe you don't want to, but it's not on the level that you really care that much, if you don't. So you have to help yourself, you have to bring yourself to that point where you actually don't want to. And at that point, you can start to work on it. You'll have the energy to work on it and control it. You know, it's just like, let's say you have to do anything. Exercise every day, change your diet, whatever. You're not going to do it until you want to. And you're probably not going to want to until you know enough about the benefit of it and the detriments of not doing it. Where it brings you to a point where it's kind of like a critical mass where you can make a decision now that you'll be able to follow. You know, in the case of serious addiction, then you're going to need help. You might say, I want to, but then you need help. You need other people to help you. So if the problem's really bad, then you're going to have to have a group to help you and to be accountable to that group because you may not be able to do it on your own. But the thing is, if you really wanted it badly enough, you would get that group. You would ensure you'd have a, a system to safeguard you. So it all goes back to developing the desire, understanding. And sometimes you'll develop that desire after you get frustrated. You know, all the people you hurt by your anger. At some point you'll just, you'll give it up because you can't stand hurting people anymore. Right? Think about it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are many meanings to the holy name. So, it only is going to feel awkward for you if you don't feel it. But if you understand, that's one of the meanings to, of the holy name. Maybe that meaning doesn't relate to you as well as Krishna. Please engage me. You know. Whatever meaning you relate to, then it's natural. Prabhupada once said, one of the meanings is Krishna, my friend, my friend. So, I want to go back to your point, because I have a theory. I have a theory that the people who argue very strongly just here tend to be the more mechanistic types, you know, pr the more processed types. Because think about it, if if the basis of prayer is feeling, if the basis of bhakti is feeling, and chanting is a prayer, and then to deny that that's what we should be doing, it doesn't make sense. And say, you should just hear. Don't feel, don't think, don't do anything, just hear. To me that sounds very, very, um, yeah, very process oriented. Now, maybe someone says that because they're such a yogi, they can just sit down and hear and be completely absorbed, and it just works. 
Okay, if that's what works for you. But my experience in doing japa retreats and workshops is that for the average devotee, the biggest problem is their mind goes off when they chant. It just wanders. Because we're not on the stage of ruchi or asakti or bhava where the mind is going to be fixed. And so when you add emotion to it, it, it causes the mind to be more fixed. It causes more absorption. And it's just, it's just something you have to experience, that you can be absorbed through experience. You can be absorbed, very absorbed. You know, like I gave the example. The man meets his girlfriend. He's very absorbed in thinking about her, but it's all through emotion. He's not thinking, what, is he thinking of anything else? Could you say, could you say, could she say, he's embracing her, and, and is she going to say, are you thinking of me right now? It's obvious, it's way beyond thinking. It's an intense emotion. So what's more powerful, thinking or emotion? Emotion is the, the more intense form of thinking. Separation is the most intense emotion. When you advance in Krishna consciousness and love of God begins, what happens? Bhava, emotion. In a sakti, which is preliminary to bhava, there's like the seed of emotion, but the sattvika bhavas don't manifest until the stage of bhava. So that means the higher you go, the more emotion there is. And then when you go into prema, those sattvika bhavas become more intense, and then there's more emotion. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, the process of advancing in bhakti is just the development of emotion. He said, shadha, the first stage, you actually have emotion. It's just a very small amount of bhava. In each stage you have more bhava. And you have complete bhava on the stage of bhava. So I, it's, I, just, I just want to communicate that we shouldn't, you know, if, if, if someone just wants to focus on hearing, I'm not going to argue with them, but I would just say it shouldn't be at the cost of minimizing emotion and prayer, because it's a prayer. And every meaning that the Acharyas have given of the Holy Name, it's actually a prayer, every single meaning. Krishna, please, it's vocative. It's not mantra. It's not, oh my Lord, it's please my Lord. It's not, om namo bhagavate vasudeva. It's please. It's a prayer, it's asking. So it's different. You understand? Because, you know, if I just say, Oh my Lord, oh personality of Godhead, it's a glorification. But when I'm asking for something, there's an emotion when you ask. Right? Personal. You have to love somebody. You know, I think there's a saying, to love everybody is to love nobody. You know, in, um, it says in the Shastra that a devotee, he can't love everybody because he has to show his love to someone he knows. It has to be a thought in his mind. Like, he can't show mercy to the whole world. He has to show it to someone that he knows. So Prahlad Maharaj, he wanted to show mercy to everyone. But the Acharya said, you can only show mercy to people you know because you're asking Krishna, please show mercy. So I can't just say, show mercy to everybody. Well, who is everybody? Oh, here's my father, here's my mother. But he wanted to show mercy to everybody. So Krishna blessed him. And in the Bhagavatam it said that whoever reads this chapter on, on Prahlad will be liberated. So he got his wish fulfilled that he could liberate everybody if they heard the story. But normally it has to be a focus on somebody. So you really can't love everybody in a personal way. Yes, somebody has, yes. Samji, at our level, uh, how much we can feel is very limited. And after some time, it goes to mind that you know, I have to think that I should feel. So, What's the option? 
feel nothing. The option is mechanical chanting. No, it's because you're not used to doing it that you have the doubt. He's saying, I can't feel, so then I just go back on my head. Then my head says, try to feel. Okay, let me, let me help you feel. And then this is, this is how you do it. How many lifetimes have you been in the material world? Pull out your iPhone and tell me. Are there enough zeros on your iPhone to calculate? I don't think so. Is there? Anybody know? How many? How many? All right. You know? <coughs> A hundred to the what power lifetimes, right? A hundred to a zillion power. So we've been in the material world a lot of lifetimes, okay? And we've, we have turned against Krishna in every lifetime. Somehow or other, we ended up in Kali Yuga, where Lord Chaitanya decided to give love of Krishna to people who don't deserve it. And not just ordinary love of Krishna, but love of Krishna imbued with the mood of the residents of Vrindavan. That's amazing, isn't it? And it happens every 8,430,000,000 years. Once in every 8 billion. Once in Adeya Brahma, which is 8,430,000,000 years, Lord Chaitanya comes and gives the holy name endowed with love. He comes other times, but it's not endowed with this love. Guess what, everyone? I just want to let you know, you happen to come at the right time. That's one chance in 8,430,000,000. You made it right here. Are you feeling anything yet? <laughs> now, I'm going to get you to feel something else. Right? How old are you? 29. What's the average lifespan in... India for a man? 60-65. So, if you live an average lifespan, 60-65, that's all? They probably... <laughs> anyway, let's say, we'll, we'll give the benefit of the doubt, and we'll say you'll live 40 more years. So, at least live to be... 69, yeah. Well, I guess a lot of people, the kid babies die from disease, so it lowers it. Anyway, so you're going to live another 40 years, okay. You've been in the material world how many lifetimes? We don't know. If you become Krishna conscious in this lifetime, 40 years, you might think 40 years is a lot. It's not. Believe me, it's going to go like that. In 40 years, you could be dancing with Krishna. Is that amazing? Only 40 years. For me, who knows? It might be less than 40. Probably will be, right? It could be 20, it could be 10, it could be 5, it could, but it's not going to be long for me. Right? Is that amazing? If, if after millions and millions of lifetimes, that this is the last one, is that amazing? Now you just meditate on those two things. When you chant, you feel something, believe me. <laughs> And if you just keep meditating on it, it'll become a default position that whenever you chant, that's how you feel. Let me tell you something about psychology. You probably have this experience. You come into the temple, right? And you smell some incense or you smell a flower garden and you think, that was the incense they were burning the first day I came to the temple. And all these thoughts of the first day that come to the temple, right? It's just, right? So all these feelings and emotions I'm talking about, if you keep practicing them, then as soon as you go like this and your fingers touch your beat, you'll feel those emotions because that's what you feel every time you chant because you practiced it. You practice that meditation. You know, I feel, I feel in the holy name, Lord Chaitanya's mercy, his fortune. This is what he's given me. I feel so grateful to have the holy name. And I practice doing that while I chant. So every time I pick up my beats, it's anchored in there psychologically. It's just, I touch them, and all of a sudden those emotions come. And I can prove that, because most of you, when you touch your beads, you get sleepy. <laughs> you just touch them, and, and you know, just watch yourself tomorrow, like you're sitting there, and you get your beads. Just watch what your body does. And I bet for a lot of you, if you just watch it, it actually goes down. Because for you it's hard because that's what you'd anchored in there. 
because you haven't practiced these things. So you've, you've just allowed the bad experience, and then when you touch your beads, your like, energy level goes down. And you practically expect to have a hard time, you expect you'll fall asleep, you'll expect to be distracted, because that's your experience, because you haven't tried to bring in these other feelings, emotions, <coughs> thoughts. But when you do it, wouldn't that be amazing? That when you do that and you just touch your beads, you have all these emotions. Like I'm so fortunate, the holy name is, it's, it's the greatest gift Krishna is giving me. My relationship exists within the holy name. Um, I, it's just my opportunity to reveal my heart to Krishna and I can express everything I want, right? All those emotions overcome you. Because that's what you're experiencing, that's what you're focused on when you're chanting. And it'll all come up. Wow. Why not? Try for it. See if it works. Because my point is that what the, if we don't do that, one of the biggest problems we have is that we fall back into this boredom syndrome or just a distracted mind and mechanically chant. You get a shoe and bang your head while you chant. You know, that's not what we want to do. Get a megaphone and you know, stick it in your ear. That's not exactly what we want to do. You know, we can create a new, create a new device, right? And it goes like this. You know. Well, actually, it could go in both your ears, and then you can get, you know, like a, some kind of helmet, you know, and put a picture of Krishna on the helmet, and you know, isolate yourself. That's not actually what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's all artificial. You know, I, I don't know if you know this story, but they have these things called harmonica holders. They're little metal pieces. They go around your neck, and they hold a harmonica, which is a little instrument like this, so that you, can, you play it in your mouth. And so it, you can just, this thing holds the harmonica, and you can just put it up and play it while you play a guitar. And so one devotee had a harmonica old holder and he put a picture of Krishna on it so that, you know, this picture of Krishna was always in front of him so he wouldn't forget Krishna. And then that went back to Prabhupada and Prabhupada said, take that off. That's completely artificial. That's not the process. Yes? Yeah. It does, but there's two ways of looking at it. And it's the same argument. Hear and you'll get the emotion, or have the emotion and you'll hear. Okay. How would someone chant who's really into their chanting? Well, let's do a little test. Would they chant like this? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. <laughs> or would they chant like this? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. They would. So they would automatically do the posture and everything, right? So if you're, if you're doing what I'm saying, you're not going to do it like this. Oh, oh Krishna, please, please accept me. Please accept me. It's not going to be that way. But if you actually feel it, it's Hare Krishna, please accept me, please accept Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, isn't it? Hare Ram. Because your, your physiology is going to manifest your psychology. Now, if you don't have that, then I would say, yeah, then sit straight, because then your physiology can change your psychology. But wouldn't it be better to have the right psychology to affect your physiology rather than the other way around? Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to give you another example. This is very heavy. <laughs> and it's really good. If two people are in love, does anyone have to teach them how to communicate? They always talk, right? If two people are not in love and you teach them how to communicate, does that mean they're going to fall in love again? No. It just means they know how to communicate. It doesn't mean they like one another. Right? So just because you sit straight, it's like you've learned to communicate. But it doesn't necessarily mean all the feelings and emotions will be there. It just means, okay, you probably won't fall asleep. And maybe you'll concentrate more because you're <coughs> sitting straight. But if you have 
the proper attitude in chanting, it'll put you up straight automatically. It's, so whenever you see yourself slouching and low energy, it's all a result of how you're thinking and feeling. And so you should become conscious. If I'm chanting like that, it's because I'm thinking like that. Right? Like any time I start to slouch when I'm chanting, that's the first thing I think. Oh, I'm losing my energy. I'm losing my focus. I'm losing my intention. I'm losing my emotion because it's all showing up now in my body. So. He can't. So we'll have to adjust. But still, I would say that if we do these techniques, it'll be better. It'll be easier, no matter what the obstacle is. But you have to adjust in a way you're not in pain. That's for sure. But if you really get into it, your pain might lessen. Your consciousness won't be focused on it so much. Right? Is that okay? Not okay, or maybe okay, or you think about it, or <laughs> am I too heavy, or what? Um, I'm just being very deliberate because I've taught this so much, and I've seen the challenges devotees have. And what I've seen is, if you don't make a proper effort, the tendency for most devotees on a scale of one to ten is their japa will be about three or four. And if you want to go back to Godhead, they're going to check you at the gate and they're going to, you're going to have to show them your, your Japa chart you know, for the last 50 years. And if it's three or four, they're going to send you back to Japa school. So you're not ready to go back to Godhead yet. <laughs> so three or four is not enough. And my experience is that if you don't work on it, it, that's basically where it ends up. Three, four, five. If you're a serious devotee, you'll get a little over five. But it really needs to be like seven or eight or nine. And that's going to take effort. And, and it, it's like you have to come to that level someday. So all we're doing here is trying to help you get there faster. Because you have to come to bhava. That's where your relationship... Our relationship with Krishna is revealed at the stage of bhava. Until we come to that stage, we're not going to get out of here. That's how we're going to get out of the material world. So it's all there in the chanting. But it's, you know... It's just going to take you a longer time if you, you know, just we say putts around. I don't know if you have this word putts. Putts around means just kind of, like it sounds, putts. Can you understand what that means? Putts around. It's like what old people do. They putts around. They're busy doing nothing. <coughs> you know. Puts them around, counting their stamps, or counting their old coins, or you know, putting things in one drawer and then another drawer. And that's putzing around, you know, busy and doing nothing. <laughs> you know, it's not intentional. Putzing around is not intentional. <laughs> okay, so we're going to end here. One more question. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the holy name is, it's the process for this age. So, pray, you're, doing, you're making the right prayer, and prayer is a process of devotional service, so that's good. But the holy name is foundational. And it's said that all the other processes are within the holy name. So that if you, you, if you pray through the holy name, then the process of prayer is contained in that. And it's more, and it's empowered through the prayer. So of course you can pray that way without chanting, and pray that way with chanting. But it'll empower your chanting, or in any way you want to pray. It just brings it. It just brings the chanting alive. Otherwise, I mean, this is the biggest problem we face is mechanical chanting. That's like it's pervading, you know, anyone, you just, somebody comes to the temple and you teach them how to chant and you give them some beads, right? 
there's a very strong tendency after one or two rounds, it's just going to get mechanical, right? Unless we help them overcome inattention, unless we help them put more focus, we help them understand this is what you're doing, you've been in the material world millions of lifetimes, this is going to get you out, this is your prayer, this is your connection, chant, listen, Krishna will speak to you, he'll guide you, he'll give you intelligence. Then it'll be better. But generally it'll just default into a, um, an experience where I'm not really fully understanding Krishna's in his name, and if I don't understand it, then it, becomes, it goes back into process. So as a dutiful person, I do the process. And I don't even try to do anything other than the process. I don't connect it to a relationship. I just do my 16 rounds and I think someday magic will happen. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But definitely it will if you do it properly. Is that okay? All right. Thank you for coming. Good luck on your japa. On my website, it's easy to remember, mahatmadas.com, and get all the japa classes. And uh, if you want to join our WhatsApp group, then I need your WhatsApp number. Did we get the names? Do you know? But if you want, if you want to get on my mailing list or you want to, on my WhatsApp group, we send out messages to inspire you and make you think. Then just give me your WhatsApp number. Where do they write it down? Is there a sheet out there? Okay, we're going to pass around a book. Um, please write in capitals and um, your name, your email, and if you want to be on the WhatsApp group, then also on the WhatsApp group. You just give us your WhatsApp number. And uh, all the classes I do are on Facebook and on my YouTube channel. And if any of these classes actually recorded well, they'll end up on Facebook and my YouTube channel also. So you can... Oh yes, we have CDs. Um, the course we did on vows, we have a CD and we have the Japa CD, which is the recordings of Japa workshops. We have forgiveness, we have marriage. We have um, all my stories about Prabhupada, things you've never heard about Prabhupada. And um, a couple others. So it was nice seeing you all again. Be good while I'm gone. Don't get into trouble. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Kija. O Premanandi.